uh, uh, if you haven't been with us for the past couple weeks, we're in a new series going through the Beatitudes, which we just read together. It's found in Matthew chapter five, where Jesus sits down on a hillside, gathers a group of people close to him. And as he sits, he opens up his official teaching, his heart. And so Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we read this incredible message, incredible sermon um, that I would encourage you to read over this six weeks together. Um, uh, and I, we've called this series Voice of Reason uh, because Jesus is our voice. And I don't know about you, but we all need uh, a voice of reason. There are times in my life, uh, in your life, in our life where we need somebody uh, to say, hey, is that reasonable? Uh, I don't know, I have to confess something this morning. Uh, recently, I saw something on Instagram. I saw a post from a person that I know who is a pastor who was projecting himself in a way that he's not. And I had this crazy idea. I know this person. I thought maybe, maybe if I commented with something really snarky. He would change his heart, change his mind. He would be healed of his ego and everything would be righted. So I opened up my phone. I clicked the, the little comment bubble and I typed it out with my thumbs. It was so good, so a little witty, a little sarcastic. Like it was so good. Like maybe he would repent and come to, anyway. Before I hit send and sealed my fate in the Instagram archives, I thought maybe, I had this thought like, Maybe I should phone a friend and ask if this is a good idea. So I took a screenshot and I sent it to one of my friends and I said, hey, uh, let me run this by you. What do you think? And he said, Brent, that's good. It's really hilarious. It's very true, but don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Better to talk to a person in person in love than to go the passive aggressive uh, route of posting the online thing. And uh, I needed that. Do you need that? Uh, do you need people in your life that give you a word, an encouragement, a voice to speak truth, uh, to speak something, a correction of some irrational or emotional or unreasonable thought? We all need voices of reason in our life. I told you I wasn't perfect, so I'm leading with that, okay? There is never a, a more true moment in our culture than in the American political season. Like We need voices of reason. The lead up to the election is something uh, this political machine pulls us in, demands our attention, tempts our affections, and says, trust me and give me all of your time, your energy, demands a lot of things in us. And it creates a lot of unreasonable, irrational uh, posts, behaviors, relational turmoil, and we need good, true, pure, and right, faithful voices to guide us. So as a church, we are leaning in to the voice of Jesus. We are leaning into his voice and his teaching to kind of direct and dictate how we think, how we act, how we react, how we respond to lead us to a better posture. So again, we've opened up to Matthew chapter five and we've read the Beatitudes. Two weeks ago, we read, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are actually crushed, utterly helpless for they have a kingdom that they can be a part of that's an everlasting kingdom. Last week, we talked about grief in a real honest way. And Jesus comes with an announcement. He says, blessed, bliss, joy is yours for those who are grieved and gutted over the, your internal reality and the things around you, for you have a comforter. And today we move on to verse five, Matthew chapter five, verse five. Jesus says to them and to us, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does that mean, inherit the earth? We'll get there in a little bit. But what does meek mean? What, it, what does it mean to be meek? What do you think of when somebody says something is meek? Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines meek as quiet, gentle, easily imposed upon, or submissive. I talked to my boys. Uh, they're brilliant, sophomore, senior in high school. And I said, uh, when you hear the word meek, what do you think? And one of my sons think, says, I think of skinny or frail. Okay, that's interesting. My other son said, I think of small, right? Uh, Luke, our beloved worship pastor, said, when he thinks of meekness, he thinks of meerkat. 
Another person said, I think of a mouse, as meek as a mouse. Actually, my grandmother used to say that, as meek and as quiet as a mouse. And I think that's what we think. Mice are quiet. They are small. They are easily imposed upon, and yet they are annoying. They are easily imposing upon our things, gnawing at our things, eating our baked goods. Mice are easily disposed, and nobody really considers a mouse, right? Like easily discarded. And I believe that's the cultural idea and clearly the definition of meekness. It carries with it an idea of spinelessness or just subservience or submission. It often paints an image of a person that is unimportant, unintelligent, or somebody who might not be very effective. They're ineffective. They're quiet. They're submissive. They're weak. They're, ma- they're mousy. Meekness is often understood as weakness, but the word that Jesus uses when he sits down on this hillside, all these different people are gathered together from different walks of life. He says, blessed are the meek, and he speaks it in Aramaic. It is uh, written to us and to the world in Greek, and it's this Greek word, pros. This was one of the great Greek ethical words. In the Greco culture, Greco-Roman culture of that day, the Greek culture, um, Pros was a, was a virtue, meaning it was a behavior that, that showed high moral standards. And Aristotle actually wrote often about meekness. Aristotle was the great uh, Gre- uh, Greek philosopher and scientist, one of the most influential and intellectual figures in Western uh, uh, history. And he saw meekness as this, as this virtue, as this virtue of being the balance between two extremes. And I found that really interesting. Meekness is this balance between two extremes. So you can have the extreme and excessive spending, selfish spending on yourself and your self-gratification and yourself. And on the, that's one extreme. On the other extreme, it's extreme hoarding and not spending and not sharing. Like meekness is this middle ground where generosity leads your heart. And it's this middle ground between two extremes, two excesses. Or take anger. He thought, wrote about anger some. Excessive anger, extreme anger on one side. And then on the other side, you had extreme or excessive passivity. Meekness was this virtue. That this, it was this healthy middle ground where you were angry but never at the wrong time and always at, to the right proportion. Like the meek person could be angry at the right time for the right reasons in the right way. I found that really interesting. Meekness as the ideal balance between extremes. So we see meekness as a proper and virtuous balance. People would have thought of that when Jesus spoke it. How much do we need that today? A proper and virtuous balance. Do you know much in our culture that is meek today? Or are we noticing life on the extremes and the extravagance and the excesses? When it comes to our work, there's like hustle culture, workaholism, and then on the other side, there's kind of laziness and minimal effort. The meek is a balance of diligence, hard work, and rest. There are extremes on the political landscape that we don't really need to talk about. But there's tribalism on both sides and on either side. So then there's extreme and excessive passion and emotion and energy and activism. And then there's the other side politically that's just like completely kind of apathetic and ignorant of everything that's happening in the world. And the meek middle is kind of this principled, level-headed engagement. I think we are hungry as a culture for meek people. And Jesus lived in a time uh, of culture of extreme excesses. There are extremes on every side. There are excessive impulses amidst people and politics. There was religious manipulation that kept people far from God, and there were overreactions that seemed completely out of control. And into the midst of this life on the fringes, on the extremes, on the excesses, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, where you have this proper and virtuous balance. Those who do not get tempted into the excessive or the extreme, but who are held together, who are under control. In fact, that's the second idea of that Greek word, pros. It's this word that is often used um, to speak to an animal that has been domesticated, an animal that has been trained and can respond to the reins of saying like, hey, we're going to go left right now, and the animal actually responds 
Uh, it's, it's this word that says um, one, one who has received limits and accepts control, accepts guidance. Meekness is also strength under control. It is a proper and virtuous balance, but it is also strength under control, like a wild horse that has to be garnered in and, and broken, and, and it, it, it can be ridden after that point. Meekness is often understood as weakness, but in reality, it is strength under control. Again, not mousy, but kind of like an elephant. Um, did anybody ever go to a zoo? Uh, and this is my age, because I think this is probably banned by PETA or some kind of animal rights activist. Did you ever go to a zoo and ride an elephant? Anybody ever ridden an elephant? Okay, be proud. Okay, I did, so I'm about to out myself. All right, when I was a kid, I went to the Louisville Zoo in Kentucky, and my mom said, hey, do you want to ride an elephant? And I said, what? And I climbed up on a ladder with my little sister and my little brother, and I looked and looked and looked for a picture of me on this elephant, but I have ridden an elephant. Don't throw something at me, all right? But there were these massive creatures, and I'm just telling you that because I have learned this week about the power of elephants, Elephants are incredibly powerful. They can uproot trees. They can lift up to 13,000 pounds. They are the most strong, the most powerful land animal on the planet by far. However, they are usually incredibly peaceful, right? Interacting with their environment and other animals and clearly little kids who are on their backs in a calm and deliberate way. They are, they're not aggressive, but they are protective when it's required. They are incredibly strong, but their strength is not used recklessly with care. They are and exude meekness, having power, but choosing to keep it under control. Not excessive, not extreme, but balanced. This is the idea of meekness, strength under control. I love Proverbs 16, verse 32. It says, better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. Better to, to be patient, to wait, than to just power up. Better to have a sense of under control, I'm under control, than to conquer a city or blow up a city or blow up your dinner table or blow up that conversation or blow up that relationship. It's better to be patient than to power up and create a wake of destruction in your, in your path. Jesus says, blessed are you who are like that, who are meek, who are under control, strength under control, proper balanced, because you are placing yourself under the reins, under the control, under a higher authority that's telling you how to respond. You are learning the limits of life. You are learning the direction and the voice of God, and you're listening to it, saying, I'll go this way, I'll go that way. I'll let these kids sit on my back. There's control. And again, this makes me think of Jesus. Jesus embodies meekness in such a powerful way in the garden. Jesus has lived his life. He shared hope for everyone. He's healed the blind. He is powerful. He calms the wind and the waves, and they obey him, the scripture tells us. And now he's in the garden facing his crucifixion. He's just been betrayed by a friend who he washed this friend's feet along with all of his friends. They share a meal together. He leads them in the Last Supper. And now he's in the garden called Gethsemane. And he is praying through the night, knowing what's ahead of him. Again, he's going to be nailed to a tree for six hours. And he is begging God for another way. He's saying, God, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. He's sweating like drops of blood. And we read that in the middle of the night, a mob comes to arrest Jesus illegally at that time, I might add, in the middle of the night. Now, I don't know what happens when you know that you are up against it, when like an oppositional force is coming up against you, but I tend to get a little defensive. I tend to like throw up some walls. I tend to kind of brace myself. You know, you kind of clench your fists. You, you're, you're ready for something. Look at Jesus' posture. The men come to arrest Jesus. Matthew 26 says, the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. 
John actually tells this story as an eyewitness in John chapter 22, verse 52, and he said, Jesus then said, spoke and said, no more of this. And he reached out and he touched the man's ear and healed him. Verse 53, do you think I can't call on my father, the Lord, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Now, first of all, I noticed the reaction of Jesus' friends. Like Jesus' friends, he's asked to pray with him for all through the night. They keep falling asleep. Jesus is discouraged at their lack of like attentiveness to their friend. And they finally wake up when the mob shows up to, to arrest Jesus. And the first thing they do, Peter pulls out his sword and cuts off a dude's ear. And Jesus says, did you catch it? He said, what are you doing? Don't you realize that I could ask my father for a thousands, uh, uh, like thousands upon thousands of angels to protect us in this moment? He would send them instantly. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? Talk about two extremes, like two paradigms. You have this, um, you have Peter pulling out his sword. Jesus says to him, don't you know that all who live by the sword will die by the sword? And he says, that's not my way. No more of that way. And then talk about strength under control. Jesus says, don't you know I could snap my fingers in this moment and all of my suffering, my pain, all of this injustice being done to me could be over, but he has submitted his will to the will of the Lord. He has said, I'm strong, I'm fine, but this was strength under control. He was meek, he embodies meekness. Actually turns around in this moment and heals some guy's ear was obedient to what God wanted to him. He chose to step under God's control. Let's ask a few questions really quick. What controls you? What controls us? Under what authority are you? And what authority is driving you, is driving your reactions, your responses, your behavior, the words coming out of your mouth, my mouth? What drives and dictates our posture or our use of power or our powering up? Are we out of control or are we under control? Are we, are we listening to the reins? Do we even have reins attached to it? Are we just kind of going wherever we want to go? Are we the ultimate authority in our life or have we put ourselves under the authority of the Lord? See, meekness is strength under control. And meekness is ultimately resigning as God. It's this proper balance between two extremes. It's it's saying I'm there's strength under control, and it's ultimately resigning as as God. Do you know anybody in your life who needs to resign? Um, uh, We have four kids, and uh, often one of our kids will usually take the posture of, I'm going to tell everybody else how to respond and how to react, and uh, you need to do this, and you need to do this, and we find one of our kids trying to parent the other kids. Anybody else have this? And as they get into high school, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and Jenna and I will often say like, hey, hold on a second. Are you the parent? Or are we the parent? Like you are a really bad parent. You need to probably resign as dad. You're not the dad, I'm the dad. She's the mom, you're not the mom. You should probably just be quiet. You are, we are resigning you as parent over the other kid. Do you know anybody in your life that needs to resign? Have you seen an example of a healthy resignation? Uh, I was uh, listening, I listened to a podcast called Becoming Human with Steve Cuss. And Steve Cuss was a lead pastor of a pretty large church and it was very demanding on him. And he was kind of like operating not in his wheelhouse and not out of his strength. And he talks about on this podcast how it was creating leadership anxiety in him. And as an effect, it was creating anxiety in the rest of his staff and his team and the culture of the organization, the church at large. And he finally had to come to this point and it's like actually pretty remarkable. He had this moment of self-awareness where he said, I need to resign as the leader of this church, as this organi- of this organization. And I want to step into a different, lesser uh, role of sorts. And it's fascinating to me because that, that takes a lot of humility. How many CFOs do you know who are like, you know what, I'm not doing the best job, I'm not in the right place, so I'm gonna resign and I'm gonna take a different position over here. Or a CEO that says like, I'm gonna resign and step down and just be, you know, that takes, that takes humility, takes self-awareness, 
And that's what meekness is. It is resigning ultimately as God of your own life. It's meekness is saying, I resign as God of the universe. You know what, God? I've tried to manipulate and dictate and uh, orient like how I would run the universe and I failed miserably. I'm doing my best to just like be a good parent to my family. I'm gonna resign the right. I'm gonna resign as Lord over my own life and everyone else's life. I want to give control to you, Lord. And this is really hard where pride says, power up and push through. Don't show weakness. You're the center of the universe. You do you. Meekness says, God, I trust you with everything. I trust you with my life. I love reading through uh, Moses's life. If you read through Exodus and, and Numbers, you, you'll get a glimpse of Moses's journey. And Moses, right, this great man who led uh, a generation of slaves held captive in Egypt free, he goes to Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, whoa, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, okay, after all these plagues, like Moses was incredible. But, but Moses, we read in Exodus chapter 33, like Moses would meet with God as a friend. Exodus 33 says this, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one who speaks to a friend. A little aside, don't you want that in your relationship with the Lord of all creation? I wanna speak with God, speak to God. The Lord would speak to me, speak to you face to face as one who speaks to a friend. Don't, isn't that what we're after, what we desire? Where did this come from in Moses? Did, Mo, did the Lord speak to Moses face to face because he was a great communicator? No, actually, he wasn't a great communicator. He needed help with that. Did, did the Lord speak to Moses because he carried a staff really powerfully? No. Did, did, did he do it because he was a, a great shepherd? A great, uh, why, why did the Lord speak to Moses face to face? Well, in Numbers, we kind of get a glimpse of this. It's because Moses was meek. It said, now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people on the face of the earth. I think that's fascinating. Moses, this great leader that everyone would come to for help and direction, that led generations through the wilderness out of the Red Sea, meekness marked him. Where did he learn that meekness? Probably from the first time that he came to a burning bush in the woods and it said like, uh, what is happening here? And then he runs into the holiness of God and he falls to his face in fear and he recognized like, I'm not God, he is. He resigned the right to be God over his life and he learned meekness and something happens. He has a remarkable relationship with the Lord. See, remarkable meekness leads to remarkable relationship. Remarkable meekness leads to a remarkable relationship with your friends, with your roommates, with your spouse, with your parents, with your enemies. Meekness, if meekness marked your relationship, it would change it. And this is true in our relationship with the Lord. And you see it on these people. You see it on Moses. You could see it as he came down from the mountain after spending time face to face with God. The people said like, Moses, you're like glowing. You're like radiant. Like what have you been? And Moses has been with the Lord and you can just see it on him and it's reflecting on everyone else. Do you know somebody like that? Or you just see them and you're like, man, there's something different about them. That you just see meek, you see the power of God in their life. This is another part of meekness. Meekness is reflecting the character and nature of Christ. We already talked about how Jesus embodies meekness, but I just wanna remind you, he says, I am gentle and humble in heart as he holds the power and authority to quiet the storm. Again, the wind and the waves obey him. He also says, come to me, all who are weary, who are burdened, who are worn down, my yoke, my way is easy and my burden is light. I'm gonna give you rest for your souls, he says. This is the meekness of Jesus, strength under control. He says that as he has the authority to cast out demons. And then he says, let the little children come to me. See, Jesus has this, this characteristic. He's standing in the midst of all of these extremes. There's the angry, there's the apathetic. There's the politically violent, and there's the passive and the poor. And Jesus is in the powerful middle, strength under control. 
And you and I are invited to reflect that character to the world around us. Paul writes to the church in Philippi. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, the same characteristics as Christ Jesus, who, being God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he emptied himself. He made himself nothing nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by stepping under the authority of the Lord, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul says, have the same mindset and reflect the character and the nature of Christ. And the first Christians got this. Like they started living the way of Jesus and were, were strong, but not like excessive force. Had this boldness and courage about them, but were not power hungry and grappling for anything outside of what the Lord had for them. And they were recognized as ordinary men and women who had been with Jesus. That's what I wanna be known as, just an ordinary group of people who have been with Jesus. They were recognized by their ability to not lose themselves amidst all the cultural pressures and expectations. They were known by reflecting the character of Christ. And Jesus says, he sits down on a hill and he says, blessed are the meek, blessed are the meek for you will inherit the land. Let's read that again. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. So what's the promise on the backside? What is this about? Like, if you're meek, you get a house. That would be nice. If you're meek, you get more money. I don't know. If you're meek, you get health and riches and wellness and all the things. If you're keeping it all under control, God's got like a portion of land for you somewhere. That would be Fantastic, but I don't think that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. See, back then, the Jewish people, to them, everything and, and often still is about the land. God's promise to Abraham was about a land and a people that his people would enjoy. The people of God were promised a promised land. They were then pulled from the land. They were held as slaves in the land of Egypt. They wandered the land of the wilderness for 40 years. They finally got to the Jordan and Joshua led them into the land where there were enemies all over the land. Then they finally found, they kind of had a place to to land, no pun intended, and then they were exiled from the land into the land of Babylon. They finally made it back to the land and they were oppressed in the land when Jesus says this by Rome. This was a deeply agricultural society that lived off of the land. They believed that they were created from the dirt, from the land. Everything was land. What was the land for them? The land represented a promise. The land to them represented a place where they could rest. Like that was home, that was safe. The land represented a sense of identity. Like this is who we are, this is our place. The land ultimately represented destiny, a purpose, a meaning that God was walking with them. And so for years, there were wars. For millennia, there have been wars over the land extremes over the land, excessive force, excessive fear. There's been excessive power and extreme hopelessness. And because they were so, if we could just fight, if we can fight and fight and claw to get to a place where we know who we are, we feel safe. There's a place of rest. There's a place of identity. There's a a destiny for us. And Jesus steps up and he says, good news. Blessed are those who are meek, under control, balanced, under the authority of God, resigned of God, because you will discover your destiny. You will inherit the land. Meekness is discovering a destiny. He's saying when you get to a place where you give up trying to fight your way, when you give up the right to be God, when you, when you exude strength under control, a sense of balance and trusting in the Lord, you discover, you inherit the land. The psalmist says this in Psalm 27, he says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And Jesus announces the good news of the Lord for all of them, this desperate for a sense of rest and peace and, and an everlasting kingdom to be a part of. He said, good news, blessed are you who are meek. For that destiny, that rest, 
that promise, it is yours today and it is coming. There is an eternal kingdom that you can be a part of and this inheritance is for you. This inheritance is for you. Now, do you know the thing about an inheritance? Like rest, promise, a sense of home, a sense of, the thing about an inheritance is that it is not earned. It's, it's, it's given to you. It's received in relationship. If you've got parents in this room, you, you are gonna inherit something from your parents based on that relationship with your mom, with your dad. I am gonna inherit something from my father. It'll probably be his 2007 F-350 and some debt but I'm gonna inherit that from him based off of relationship. That's what I'm gonna inherit. And that is not earned. It is, it is received in relationship. What I love about this is Jesus says, the meek have an inheritance. The meek receive something out of their relationship with God. And you might say, am I a child of God? The promise for you and me in Jesus is that we are invited to partake in that inheritance. Jesus goes to the cross, is nailed to it, suffers, forgives the sin of the world, the sin and shame and deceit and power mongering, all of the things that, that have warred against humanity for all of creation. Jesus says, no more of that. You can now know your name, you can now know your identity. You can now experience soul rest as a son, a much loved son or daughter of God. Paul says this in Romans. He says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We're gonna suffer with him, but we're also gonna share in his glory. He says, this is your promise. You can inherit. You can be a co-heir with Christ as a much loved son or daughter of God. Have you received sonship from Jesus? Have you received this identity to say, you are a daughter of God, a much loved daughter of God, chosen, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, set apart for a purpose. That's what Jesus says when he says, you will inherit the land as sons and daughters, and that promise is for you. I just wanna say, if you are wrestling with, if you have never given your life to Christ, if you are, have never trusted his sacrifice on the cross, if you have never seen the empty tomb and the sin and death and, and despair that he left there, would you receive it today? It's your inheritance. Would you receive sonship today? Forgiveness for sin, our destiny. Today, you know this but our culture is so power hungry, is so gripped with fear and ambition and this drive to dominate and control people in situations, put people in their place, post the comments, right? Because we wanna right every injustice in the world as we take the right of God. But Jesus says, there's a different way. No more of that. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I have come to show you a different way. May we live as the meek and see the grace of God the kingdom of God advance in our community, in our city, in our hearts. We love, let's pray together. We love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for today. And we thank you for your words that challenge us, that challenge us and encourage us. And um, we trust that your word is living and active and does not return void. And so today, Father, as I, as we hear your words, would you stir in our hearts? Would you move in our hearts? Would you break our hard hearts and lead us closer to you? Remind us of who we are and remind us of the rest, the identity, the promise, the destiny you have for each one of us in Jesus' name. Just give us the power to trust you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name, amen.